Hello and welcome to the final uh, episode of In the Waterweeds Drums of Autumn. It's a very sad night, except next week is hanging out. <laughs> and that makes me want to shoot myself in the face. Hello, and welcome. <laughs> this is That's Normal. I'm Beth, and this is In the Waterweeds. This is our boozy book club slash hangout lender slash fun times book discussion about Diana Gabaldon's novels. And this particular one is the last edition of Drums of Autumn, parts 11 and 12. We finally get to see how everything just kind of plays out and wraps up and gets us prepared for the next novel. And we're ready to dive into it. We're here tonight. I'm not drinking anything because was, it was really hard for me to get ready to, to do this tonight. But I wanted to say hi anyway. Um, and now everyone else can say hello. Amy, say hi. Introduce yourself. Hey, it's Amy. Um, I, I'm exhausted. The Red Sox won the World Series. I've got Boo. all my Red Sox outfits. <laughs> Boo. Did they win? I, I thought that the, I thought somebody else on the other team made a really great home run the other night. Thought they won. There was a lot of really good. There's a lot, and really of, lot of good moments. home runs, but yeah, the Red Sox win. So I'm tired. I'm drinking a Nebbiolo, and um, I too am kind of glad this is the last. Hey, I mean, as much as I you know love these books, I'm ready to read other things. Yes. And this is my third reread, and I feel like if I if y'all ever hear me talking about rereading these book series again, you smack me upside the head because I've had a stroke. <laughs> okay, mm. Jana, say hello. Hi, uh, I'm drinking cheap red wine tonight because yeah. that's how I roll. Um, I did not get all the way to the end. I got like 75 pages to the end, and then I skipped to the end, so I still feel like I'm pretty prepared, as prepared as I ever am. I feel like I did that too. I have like 40 pages that I didn't really kind of read at the end, the very end. So things happen, I'm sure, but whatever. Nikki did finish it. Nikki, say hello. Hi, everyone. I'm Nikki. I did read all the way to the end two weeks ago. So I am really ready to discuss this. I know that's a first for these kinds of things. I'm very, uh, very like happy about your overachievement. <laughs> I know. And I even wrote notes earlier on this entire thing. Amazing. Um, and I'm drinking a Chardonnay because it's been a hell of a weekend week life. Um, so I just decided to open a bottle for myself. Aww. Happy in the water weeds. <laughs> it has been quite a week. If in the water weeds can make any of us feel a little bit better about the state of the world, yes. that's what we're here for. Yeah. So, Amen, sister. Let's talk about frivolous Scotsmen and their, you know, fights with the Mohawks because it didn't really happen and that feels better than what really happened in the world. So let's get into it. Um, is anybody, uh, I don't know, I don't have Twitter pulled up. I don't know if anybody's watching us tonight, but if you are, use the hashtag in the waterweed so we can chat back at you or, you know, just put that's normal in your chat. We'll probably see that too. Um, this particular section starts out with, I think, Roger in a in a longhouse. Is that what happens? Yeah, he got tossed in the old longhouse. Wait, is this before he gets tossed in with the priest? No, no, no. I guess it doesn't start out with the longhouse. It starts out with the with I guess with his journey with the yeah. the, the other natives that they sold him to. He yes. had run away. He was, is this the part where he's in the thorns? And I was like, oh, God, oh, no. this is boring. Oh, no, 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 yeah. oh, no, 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 no. It's not thorns. It's a rhododendron hail. Oh, yeah, rhododendron. This, I'm going to start off complaining right away because that's what I do. <laughs> it bugs me when any author puts something in the point of view of a character, something that they would not know. And I guarantee you dollars to donuts that Roger had no idea that a clump of rhododendron is called a hell. And I appreciate that she did the research and it fits in with the narrative because he's in hell in a hell, but it bugs the shit out of me. And also let me just say rhododendrons is a trash plant. And if you have them in your yard, I'm judging you. Continue. <laughs> I meant to Google a rhododendron hell because I feel like that is something from Watership Down or another very, very popular like school novel from the that era. And I feel like it's something he would have known. No. Lies. Guys, I didn't even get that a, 
a grouping of rhododendron was called a hell. I just thought it was hell as in when I was reading it. So I but, skimmed that real but quick. But she does that a lot with other characters in terms of the flora and the fauna. Like there's not a tree that Claire doesn't know. I mean, you know, Roger's like, oh, look at that um, sarsaparilla sapling, you know, like, oh, give me a break. Diana, it becomes all the characters knowledge and it's not realistic. <laughs> I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna push back on something really quickly because I just Googled rhododendron hell. Now, granted, Google knows me a little bit, and so it's gonna pull up the things that it thinks I'm looking for anyway. Mm -hmm. But um, the first one is um, a blog called the Outlander Plant Guide: Rhododendron Hell. Mm -hmm. Then the next one is from our good friend um, Karen Henry at Outlandish Observations. Friday front Friday. Friday fun facts about rhododendron hells. Then there is a YouTube video. Um, I don't know if that's about Outlander or not. Then there's another one remembering Roger and the rhododendron hell. Um, all things oh, Outlander, Jesus. rhododendron hell. Outlander plant guide again. Outlander anatomy talking about a rhododendron hell in North so Carolina. So Outlander fans are dorks. <laughs> I'm just curious. Is, is it actually called that? Is it yeah. just something that... I just Googled it as well, and there are images for it, but it is mostly Outlander baloney. It's That's called what a rhododendron. Google uh, suggests rhododendron thicket. Thicket, yeah. And then they this they suggest under that a laurel hell. Yes, I saw the same. So I'm thinking, bullshit. Yeah, <laughs> it's not a thing. Well, it's not know. a thing. I mean, if you like Google murder of crows. It's not yes. going to be that one book by Ann Bishop that we read five years ago <laughs> called Murder of Crows. It's going to be what a murder of crows is. But the whole front page of Google is just outlander things. When you Google rhododendron hell, that makes me think that it's not a thing. Yeah. I'm cool with yes. that. I'm cool with thinking that she's making things up and we've put them into our like taxonomy of reality and it's not real. <laughs> it's in the outlander lexicon of life <laughs> outlander lexicon but he's in there he's lexicon. in that hell forever and ever and then at the end he gets out of it and you're like woo and then they just catch him again I'm like what was the fucking purpose of that well in oh, the meantime he finds the stone circle yeah yes exactly. oh the purpose, okay the why do they for him to find that why do they automatically just end up near stone circles? Like whether it's the Caribbean or Scotland or North Carolina. Maybe they're drawn to them, yeah. magically drawn to their That was gravity. my only thought. Because otherwise, I mean, you know, I've been through lots of places in the Southern United States. I've never seen anything that resembles a standing stone, stone circle. No. No. Agreed. I mean that doesn't happen. I lived in the Southwest United States for most of my life, more likely there than anywhere. Cause there are stone type things, <laughs> but even then. Yeah. I mean, I've tramped through the smoky mountains and things like that several times, no stone circles, which I think is part of like what this is supposed to be. It's supposed to be fairly hidden. Like if you were not in that bunch of rhododendrons, you would not have chanced upon this cliff and this circle. But at the same time, the natives who grab him with a rope are like fully aware of where he is because he, as soon as he comes free into the clearing, yeah. Yeah. they grab him and they're like waiting for him to come to the to clearing. So um, they obviously knew. Very strange little spot in the in the novel, but I feel bad for Roger at this particular point. Like, obviously, I still think it's very difficult to believe that somebody could be ha could have that much, that many like problems, like his foot, and he loses his yeah. shoes, and he's just like running around, and like his head is bleeding pr like profusely and stuff, and like yeah. like the proliferation of uh, hurts. <laughs> I just don't imagine that right. you're going to do very well without Neosporin. I mean, I just no. don't get how these people survive. Well, because then he has to run the gauntlet too, and he gets the crap beat out of him then. Yes. He goes yeah. through a lot and, like, comes away with some scratches that yeah. don't fester. Ex Explain the gauntlet to me. Why do they make him run through this gauntlet? Just for fun? It's like a little gladiatorial 
thing that they think is funny? His, well, got to earn his way in, you know? They got to got to run across some coals. You, you know, it's also American Ninja Warrior. I don't know. Yeah, they got to <laughs> torture you a little bit. Yeah. Got to show, prove yourself. I bet young Ian has to do it later. They're savages, you know, according to... Everybody in the book oh, that's not them. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but I feel like I feel like at least this is the most believable of any character in the or any time traveling character in the books. Like if any of us modern people went back, we would be the tripping, losing our shoes, <laughs> torn up, looking like shit. Like that's I totally believe Roger's character. Like that makes sense. Not people who are like just making a poultice. Just yeah. <laughs> slid into the 1700s or just the simple fact that he thinks that he's going to be able to like get away he thinks he's going to be able to like escape he's eight days from where he where jamie like found him what makes him think he's going to be able to like camp out his way eight days somewhere else like or even it just, know the general direction of where he came from. No, I, there's, I would, that's exactly what somebody from this time would be like, I can just escape. There'll be a highway pretty soon. I can <laughs> just hitchhike back. I can just it. <laughs> these woods won't be able to find me. He's like, ass, gas, or grass. Nobody rides for free. I'm going <laughs> to find me to someone to ride with. <laughs> Uh, what does he think I mean, he's I kind of do? don't blame him. Like, you know, you just take your chances, I guess. Yeah, I mean, he felt like he had to escape at any cost. But, I mean, unless you're a, any sort of eagle scout, I don't know how you're living out there, even if you think you're a smart guy. I know a couple of eagle scouts, and I wouldn't even be confident that they could handle it. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> It's a yeah. lot. There's not. He has nothing. He doesn't even have shoes. Yeah. Uh, that's that. dumb. As soon as that Indian slapped me and said in English, "Not gonna hurt you," I'd yeah. be like, "Okay, I'm with you. Let's just yeah. hang out then." Yeah. <laughs> I'll I'll fetch the firewood. If yeah, that's like, what, it what what can I do for you, sir? Right. You're not gonna hurt me. <laughs> I'm all yours, sir. Yes. Oh my god. I think this entire thing, though, sets off the fact that it, Roger cements himself as a believable character that you are sympathetic towards, empathetic towards. He has, you know, huge character shifts and changes. And all the while, Brianna is living at the aunt's pl plantation, asking slaves if they like their lives. Like, this is really where it starts. Like, you know, Roger's good and Brianna is an idiot. Yeah. So when he's like, I don't know if I'm gonna go back to the stones, you're like, run, Roger, run. <laughs> yeah. Go now. This woman I let you go through those stones, Roger. She doesn't deserve you. <laughs> Seriously. Right. He's like giving last rites in a long house and she's like, oh, I'll just blackmail my gay dad's friend or my gay friend and my dad. Like she's my gay dad's friend. <laughs> yeah, I do yeah, he is like kind of like proving his metal in this particular section for being kind of like a bumbling like weirdo for a lot of this book like yeah and i mean even even so like even his like jaunt to go after her after she's left is pretty heroic and it has its own merit or whatever and um she certainly she's just like working behind the scenes constantly she's not doing anything in particular to like help anyone's circumstance she's just doing things without thinking but yeah um i do like the sections with um once they put him in the longhouse with uh jesuit i like yeah, the that's sections. such an interesting story oh <sighs> i would read a story about the jesuit and his indian lover right mm -hmm. that was that was intense. rough after this week that was rough yeah <laughs> <laughs> please leave that out of the show <laughs> Or please leave it in. I think some of these barbs need to see something. <laughs> oh. Just uh, his, 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 I'm always fascinated by people that are so staunch and sure of their belief to their own detriment, you know? 
like his whole thing was like, oh, I'm not baptizing the baby because of the mother. I'm baptizing the baby because of me. I'm not baptizing the baby because of me. And I was just like, you're a damn fool. Yeah. <laughs> it's the same strange sense of honor that Jamie shows sometimes that you admire in principle, but in practicality yeah. is dangerous when i'm smelling your skin barbecuing yeah i don't you know who's the idiot yeah oh, and then they leave the child parentless because she pulls a daenerys and runs into the fire yeah like, holy shit doesn't even bother to give the baby to its grandmother does she hand it to claire yeah mm -hmm. just like here claire, of course yeah and i don't know i don't think i don't know how anybody could run into a fire yeah, I, I mean, I feel like I've loved in my lifetime, but unless it's to save my own child. Yeah. Jana, what were you going to say? Oh, and like she, like she just stood through his whole torture. Like didn't do anything while he's being tortured. Once she's dead, she's like, okay, that's my cue. Yeah. <laughs> Running in. Like totally calm and not reacting. And that was weird. I mean, yeah. heartbreaking and beautiful, but weird. I found his whole story kind of strange, too. It seems like they can break off from their tribe fairly easily. I mean, these people leave and go to another section at the end of this. Mm -hmm. And it seems strange to me that all of the converts to Catholicism that he garnered, instead of just picking up and moving away, I mean, there was, you know, a few dozen of them or whatever, why not just do that instead of causing some sort of like huge uproar with their, with their clan or their tribe or whatever and, and causing these major problems. It just seems strange to me that they didn't just pack up and go when they realized that their beliefs were incongruous with the rest of everyone else. I think it's these crazy, not even crazy, just religious groups who think you know, everyone's going to hell if I don't convert them. And so that is their family. That's their tribe. And so they don't want them to die in hell. So they're going to try to stay there and convert them. And, you know, then it they just get kicked out. Yeah. And then the one person who really does know what he's talking about, because he's come from the future, who does try to save them from going to their own version of hell, they, they kill him. <laughs> <laughs> Tikaba. Tikiba. I was Tikiba. like, oh my God, Tikaba. Yeah, it does take a second for that one. But um we're, we'll get to that in just a second. Um uh, cool story Mara said that she does love Roger's journey. He grows so much in this particular section. Um I what I like about Roger's journey is it's not um in the, it, throughout the whole book, but in this section is that he's not a foregone conclusion. Um, you kind of know where Jamie and Claire are going to go with things. You know what that's going to happen with them. And even thanks to this, the whole reason Brianna and Roger are there, like the, the notice of their death or whatever, in this section, they even say we have this assurance that we're going to be okay for a certain amount of time. So there's kind of a foregone conclusion with how they're going to act, what they're going to do, what's going to be important to them, and then whether or not they're going to die or not. And with Roger, he's not a foregone conclusion. I even feel like Brianna is sometimes. Um, but Roger is open. You, he could go either way. Mm -hmm. And um, I like the fact that when Claire and Jamie do tell him about Brianna's baby, and which seemed like a very quick conversation, like they get on the horse and they are out of there. Um, it seemed very, very rushed. But I like the fact that he goes, I have no idea what I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going to feel about this. You need to let me have right. some time with it. Um, I just like that he's not he's not rushing into a judgment at that particular point. Yeah. And I like that. As much as you want him to be the knight in shining armor, to, you know, almost be the Jamie who does almost always make those right at any cost decisions, mm -hmm. it was believable and it's good and interesting to see him wrestle with it. Yeah. Especially because it has so many there's so many permutations of what's the right thing to do or not. Like he could right. literally go back to the future and never have to deal with these people again, but also mm -hmm. maybe potentially believing his own flesh and blood in the past. And there's just like a lot, a lot going on. 
Um, especially like with the idea that they think that Jamie and Claire are going to die within what, like five or six years or something. Yeah. Um, so there's like a lot going on with whether or not they make certain choices. And um, which I, this was the reason that I find Jamie and Claire telling him about Brianna's baby, like so abruptly. Um, so weird. There's so much to consider and they don't like sit down and have the conversation. Right. They just kind of like throw it at him and be like, make a choice. Ah! And then, and then we gotta then go. Gone. Yeah. Well, they could at least be like, "You don't have to decide right now. Let go with us, and we'll get thirty miles the hell out of here." Yeah. Let's Wait get you me. out of here. <laughs> yes. And then. Yeah. Or take can... us to where you know that stone, the stones are, yeah. so, so we can we at the know. very yeah, so we can know because there that was kind of the whole point. They're like, "Oh, there's more stones. You know where they are. Cool. Like, <laughs> right. take us there." Um, at least like travel a little farther with them before you make a choice and you don't have to travel. You can travel in silence and have your time to think about what you're going to do or whatever. But, um, yeah, I cause I think in that moment, my thought would just be survival and I have to get away from these people where I, who almost killed me. Yes. <laughs> yeah. He's not gotten over it. <laughs> right. And you're trusting that they're not going to come after you again. Uh, yeah. And even if he did make the right decision, like he could get eaten by a mountain lion on his way to Brianna and they just yeah. left him. <laughs> so true. Yeah, like he doesn't even have. Does he have no. shoes yet? <laughs> no, he's nothing. He's no muskets. He's bleeding. The bars are going to smell him. The bars. <laughs> Jamie, quick, give me your bear fighting tips. Yeah, right? Before it involves it a fish. <laughs> beat you over the head with. <laughs> Speaking of Jamie's bear fighting skills, at one point Claire's touching his back and she's like, you know, feeling his regular scars, and then she's talking about like the deeper welts of the bear attack. And I was like, holy crap! <laughs> how is there more <laughs> going on on this man's back than what has been going on since the beginning? I couldn't. I was like, I've probably. I mean, you would think at a point, scar tissue is just not going to give. <laughs> it's, you know, yeah. it's hardened and it's just going to stay, you know, no bear claw can attack it at this point. <laughs> bear claw. <laughs> I mean, I busted my chin open three times from the ages of four to six. And the last time I got stitches, the surgeon was like, look, if she does this again, <laughs> There's nothing left to stitch together. It's just <laughs> scar tissue. Just a please, piece of leather. <laughs> please don't leave your four-year-old alone in the shower. My <laughs> <laughs> worst nightmare of like slipping in the shower or the bathtub and like busting up in my face or my chin. And as I get older, I'm more ginger about stepping into things. And I'm like, oh, what are you? You know, my parents were decent parents, but it happened in the shower at four, in the bath at four and a half, and then I was at church one night um, when I was six, and I was running down the hallway, and I turned into a Sunday school classroom. You know those little gold strips that like yeah. separate in a doorway from like one flooring to another flooring, and I slid and hit it, uh. and the blood stain was there for the next twenty five years. <laughs> I showed it to my children. I was like, look, this is where your mom busted her chin open in 1986. Let's take up a collection and <laughs> fix a good the time. carpet. It was a good time. Um, so let's talk about uh, Brianna at River Run, which is maybe my least favorite. But I, I'm just kind of super bored with this particular section. Of, like, I don't care. Um, I skimmed it so hard. Like, I remember I skimmed her trying to blackmail Lord John. Well, I love, I love Lord John. So I did read that one carefully. Yeah. I like mm -hmm. his turn of phrase. I like his yes. dialogue and the way and how, I just like how his mind works and I enjoy reading him. So I did read that part. Right. But um, I loved I, his reply to like, do you like, do I like women? Yeah. <laughs> like what is the reply? Like, you know. He's like, I, I have great esteem for them. I think they're beautiful. Like he's yeah. like, he goes on like, oh, and he's like, do I bed them? No. And I can just see him being like, <laughs> right. Maybe not, but it's not your business. Um, yeah. And I do love his reasoning for why he would never 
marry her, but it really comes down to she looks so much like Jamie that he just <laughs> There's no way that Jamie would ever let that happen because he's like, I know what you'd be thinking about when you were I know touching. How crazy is that? That he's like fully okay telling Brianna, are you sure you want to go there with me? Because I might be doing horrible things to you while thinking about your dad. Yeah. <laughs> or like, I'm just going to bypass the V altogether. We're going to go straight to the B and you're going to turn around. And I'm not, you know, like, what if is me? You're just going to be quiet and deal with it. What, what is his actual point in that particular section? Where he says, like, you don't want to know what you're going to be getting yourself into physically. Maybe he's just trying to be titillating because they're in the yeah. middle of nowhere. There's no internet. They're bored as shit. <laughs> so he's just trying to have some fun. Uh, well, you know Diana. She never turned down a titillating section right? for no reason. She can... <laughs> She likes the anal. She does. And yeah. Brianna was so ridiculous to blackmail him in the first place. Like he kind of needed, he kind of needed to like give as good as he got. Like, okay, if you're gonna yeah. blackmail me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you how it's. But gonna then she's happen. like, I wasn't really gonna do it. I just hate she's her. so like a little like a awful teenager. Like even though she's, I don't know, how old is she? Nineteen, twenty. Yeah, she's yeah. like mid. Early twenties. Yeah, I think she's like twenty-two now. Oh, and her wow. and her insisting that this baby is in no is no way that it's possible that it's Rogers makes this me is, crazy. This is what I hate about this entire book is between her and her parents saying the same damn thing. There is a chance, guys, like on yeah. both sides. It pisses me off the whole time. I'm like, shut up. Get some DNA in here. Right? Stephen Bonnet, you know, he might have, you know, given you a little squirt squirt, but he could have like low modularity or something, you know? You no. never know. Motility? Motility. Maybe it's been the last 10 years tight. since I went I through know. fertility treatments. <laughs> modularity. Modularity. He's like furniture. <laughs> He's an Ikea cupboard, but whatever. Um, Maybe he likes hot water too much. Like, we don't know. It could not work. Right? He probably, has, he probably has every STD under the planet. That's what she <laughs> totally. needs to be worried about. I know. Oh, I would yeah. be. She's going to have. Us? Yeah. It's not could... realistic for Brandon not to end up with an STD after that. She or at least seven. Has... Yes, yeah, like crabs at least. Oh, exactly. <laughs> like, she's, got H, she's got she's, HPV. She's gonna get crabs from Roger. He talks about how he's got lice in his beard. Oh. He says at one point because he's like scratching. He's like, I think this is why the Indians think we're dirty because they're hair. They're fairly hairless, and we all have lice every like all our whole bodies. Oh, that is so atrocious. Oh, uh, can I say what? Um, speaking of Lord John. <laughs> Meredith said, can we ha not have Lord John come out of the slave quarters, though? Oh, oh right? Yes. I forgot yeah. about that. Let's add some more non-consensual sex. <sighs> mm. And I, I, we can talk about that. I do, as much as I love Lord John, why in the world does Brianna make that leap? She has no idea. He's not acting any particular way. We know no. from knowing him from for several books that he's not like an effet. He's not a dandy. There's no reason for her to like make the jump that he's a homosexual. And then she's out at night and she sees him walking away from the slave quarters and she makes a leap immediately. And it could be the other things. way. He could she be the whole thing. thing. Right. About how like, oh, he's not, he's like the one guy who's not sexually attracted to me. He must be gay. And my mom doesn't like him, but likes him. You know, like she makes these very far connections. I also think that that's what she wants the reader to think, that DG wants the reader to think that. Like, oh, you know, these gay men, they don't have Tinder back then. They have the slave quarters. Like they're always so horny. Oh, could've, that makes Could have been Ill. a woman. Like, you don't know that, you know? Mm, yeah. Yeah, what is this? Like, what? Ugh, it's so gross on so many levels because it doesn't make any sense for Brianna to make that leap. It really doesn't. I mean, if mm -hmm. if, if there's a reason for that leap, please, well, actually, the reason. Um, but then there's like, there's 
Diana's the Diana level of it, which is the Diana level saying that every, number one, every dude, there's an undercurrent of sexual attraction Aggression. to everyone that Brianna meets. Mm -hmm. I, I, I know stunning women. Okay. Just beautiful women. I know for a fact that not Thanks. every man that they meet <laughs> sends off some sort of charge of their femaleness. This is not <laughs> happening. Like, does that happen to stunning women? They can't meet a single person in the whole world who's just like, hello, how are you? And perfectly kind to them. Mm -hmm. It and happens to me for the next 30 days because it's Scorpio season. So, yeah. <laughs> hey, girl. Um, and also, why does she always write this, these lines of sexual violence into her gay characters? Like, see, it's just not a good look. Yeah. Like, that, that's why that's my question about him like kind of threatening her for for the physicality of if they got together what is the point of that threat is he just talking about it not being because it doesn't seem like it's he's just like it's not gonna be good for you girl like you're gonna be left alone is it's not like that it's like a uh, it's it feels it feels like a like a danger like there's a danger in in her being willing to give him children if that were to be what's gonna happen yeah like he's not it's not just that he's that he loves men there's there's an undercurrent of of something perverse the way in the way that he expresses himself sexually and i hate that because we love him as a character and he doesn't seem like a any kind of a, a dangerous man in any of in any way and for no. her to throw that in there and make it seem like it's a possibility is disgusting right yeah maybe i'm reading it wrong or skimming it wrong which is basically what i was doing <laughs> um <laughs> And the slave quarter thing is obviously a huge problem as well. I mean. I'll be right back. I'm out of wine. Aw. <laughs> Can you get me some too? For real, I'd uh, love to have some. I should text my husband. <laughs> yeah, I, it's, um, I mean, I understand why it's in the story. Obviously, that happened. There's no not saying that Jocasta has this huge plantation without this kind of help or this kind of poor slavery but for brianna to be stupid about it like she's a modern person asking slaves do you like your life or whatever whatever the line was that was just so beyond ridiculous she knows and that's that. one point. oh sorry you go no i'm i'm done Oh, there's one point where she's like laying in bed and like noticing there's hot water and stuff. And she's like, oh, I need to remember to feel guilty about being served by slaves later. Right. Like, making out. Yeah. It's wrong life now, but this is bad. I should feel guilty later. Note to self. I noted that section. Like, I in my mind, I was like, oh, this is awful. And then I thought, wait a minute. Put myself in this girl's place. And I'm, you know, fully pregnant. And I'm in a fairly comfortable home with a feather bed. And I'm like, ooh, a feather bed. So much better than like the crap I've been sleeping on. And oh, these enslaved people probably made this feather bed. What can I do about that situation? I can't free them. I can't go sleep out where they sleep and just help them out for the next however long I'm here. I, I can't like go find some abolitionists and join their cause. I'm going to enjoy this feather bed. <laughs> like, <laughs> I feel like I would probably do the same thing in the same situation. Feel I, bad about it, but not actually well, enact anything. Well, I think we would probably feel worse about it because we would see, if you were to really go back in time, you would see slavery for the true horror that it was. You know, this isn't just a Diana problem. So many books that are about, you know, Southern life on the plantation and stuff, they just kind of treat, they treat slavery as more of like window dressing or atmosphere. There's no real true insight into the horrors of what it really truly was. I mean, I think, you know, white people are so like white people this week saying like America has never been like this. And black <laughs> people are like, uh, uh, bitch, please. Are you crazy? America right. has always been like this. You know, we've always been a violent, horrible nation in this sense, but it's starting yeah. to affect, you know, different people, you know, or you're starting to just take note of it. You know, it's 
Yeah, and I think she could have addressed it in a different way, Brianna, the character, instead of, I don't want this place, I don't want to live here, I don't want to own this, yeah, I do want to own this place, and guess what, I'm going to give it to these people, you know, I don't know how that would all function in that time, but, you know, there's I think a this better book, way she could have. I think this book is of its time, of the sense of when Diana wrote it, you know, that was still yeah. kind of the sensibility, and, but I don't think that she would be able to get away with that today. Or at least no. a newer author wouldn't. You know, I feel like she can write whatever. She has no editor, so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that brings up how are they going to adapt it for the screen? You know, what are they going to, how are they going to address this? Obviously, we've seen clips. They're at River Run. These characters are there, so. Right. Well, how would you want them to address it? I mean, I, I go back and forth between you want it to be honest, but the show is not about Phaedra. Totally. It's not about oh, Ulysses. Um, and so to have them there is in the same, in the same way, the book is not about Phaedra and Ulysses. Right. And to have them there is honest to the time period in a way, you know, mm -hmm. they're there. Um, they are given voices that at the very least Phaedra's and Ulysses. And I can't think of any other, slave off the top of my head their names but they're not they don't seem stereotypical to me um phaedra doesn't seem any different than mrs fitzgibbons for instance um right so uh ulysses has a, he has a whole backstory that he tells brianna right. um and, and i want to read both of those i thought they were both interesting characters too right and in the same way where i could read a book about ulysses i could read a book about phaedra i could read a book about the jesuit priest um and be happy with them. Yeah, um, it isn't the, their story. Right, it's not their story. No, um, I agree definitely on that that respect, but I think there are little like tips of the hat or things that they could do that recognize them as people and humans in the plight of that situation and yeah. not gloss over it yeah. as just, like you said, window dressing. I mean, do they have any people of color on the writing staff? Do they have anybody who would, who's, you know, saying to them, you write it like this, you should better expect pushback or, you know, I mean, they could put it out there. They just kind of have to accept what they, how it's viewed through the eyes of, you know, non barbs. Yeah. And that's my hope for the show. And, and you know, would, when we're separating the book from the show is that they have, um, indigenous writers or, you know, or African-American writers or directors or whatever that are actually like, you know, putting their own experience and their own viewpoint into how things are portrayed. That would be the best case scenario. I don't know that they did that. I haven't looked at any of the writing and directing credits in this season. So I have no idea. Um, I would, my my thought is that that's probably not going to be the case, especially because like I don't even know who's playing Ulysses, and he's kind of a main character in this. Um, like you see him more than you see Duncan Ennis or Fergus, even. Yeah, yeah, and um, I don't even know the character that who you know who's playing Ulysses at all. I haven't seen his name. Um, we knew Joe Abernathy, but that was it, and that was last season. So. Um, Maybe don't they know. don't spend a lot of time at, at Jocasta's. Maybe yeah, so much maybe of this not. is on the ridge because the reason to really kind of go back to Jocasta's and the whole, the turpentine and the, and the merchants and stuff, like I, it's so boring. I don't care. I just want to <laughs> be on the ridge. <laughs> and yeah. they spend so much of the time not at the ridge, which is yeah. frustrating. <laughs> Yeah, they haven't even built the house yet, right? They're still yeah. living like in the lean to. Yeah. <laughs> but the pictures, the pictures that come from the set look like they're in a well built home with trinkets galore. Like she's already oh, been yeah. to the West Elm of Fraser's Ridge and decorated. <laughs> yeah, she's yeah, found they... the world market and <laughs> they keep Is trying there... those. Is there home goods in this Fraser's Ridge? <laughs> Where can I get some tchotchkes that say live, life, love? 
<laughs> in this house, we hunt, gather. <laughs> Um, let's not talk about the fact that like everything up there is from Hobby Lobby. But anyway, um, <laughs> actually, those books are real. I just have them turned around for the color. Totally. A couple of them are really important to me. So I didn't buy I don't those. have a Hobby Lobby Perfect near editions. me. But I, oh. whenever I go into one, I'm like, ooh, I hate that I hate these people because I could spend some money here. <laughs> I know. We got one in Los Angeles, well, Burbank, and I feel a deep sense of guilt anytime I go in and I just <laughs> want to yell, birth control for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, I walk in and I go, oh gosh, uh, but the aisles are so big and all the wall art is 50% off. And you're just like, I, I just got that. some sweet 50% off wall art at Hobby Lobby. Yeah. You can just like slip the cashier like birth control pills. Yeah. As a tip. As plan, a plan B is on your way out. <laughs> I went to Michael's this week um, and kind of in protest of Hobby Lobby. Ella needed a couple of crafty things for her Halloween costume. And I was like, well, let's go to Michael's. And Michael's sucks. The aisles are so <laughs> tiny and you can't find. I mean, the aisles are tiny. I don't know if every Michael's is like this, but ours you can barely squeeze through. That's why they awful. give you the tiny cart when you're like, mm, you know. But, uh, there were it was it was so wildly like overcrowded in there, and I was like, I need to get my ass to Hobby Lobby. This was <laughs> <laughs> next time you come to LA, I'll take you to the original Michaels. Okay, oh. it started here. It's called Moscatels. <laughs> mm. I spend. All, that's where I get all of my cross stitching supplies from. So I feel like me and Michaels are tight. What Love happened? Michaels. <laughs> um, let's get into anyway. Jamie and Claire in this particular section. I know everybody that's watching is like, they still think we're talking about the secondary characters. And like, ooh, this is getting good. And then we just went <laughs> on like a long craft store tangent. But um, so Jamie and Claire in this point at the beginning of this section are not speaking to one another. And we find out later, thanks to young Ian, that it's just a misunderstanding. The two of them think that the other is mad at the other. And... Um, I find that really dumb. Thought. So many bullshit misunderstandings. Like it's the whole book is based on jumping to conclusions and misunderstandings. And that one chapter that's called all is revealed. Like you knew it was a bullshit storyline and you just wrote it as a chapter title. Like mm -hmm. anyway, whatever. I do like the stories that, they tell themselves about why the other one is mad. That does feel very real to me. Or maybe I'm just down like a major Brene Brown rabbit hole right now about mm -hmm. how you can't create a story for someone else of why they're acting the way they're acting. So Claire is like so convinced that it's, you know, about, I can't even remember why she thinks that he's mad. And she it's thinks he's mad because she, he didn't tell her, she didn't oh, tell she him didn't about on it. Right away. Mm -hmm. That's right. But it's really, he's just thinking about Frank. And he's just like, what? No, you stupid Egypt or whatever he calls her. And it's just like, <laughs> I found that to be pretty real because we do that as human beings. We create stories for how the other person is behaving. And then when they really tell us, we're just like, uh oh. But all of that well, would be it. solved in books and in real life if people just talk to each uh, other. Yeah. Like, they want a month. Yeah. Like they, that's in what... this, a whole month, like without communicating at all. Yeah, that that's seems a long weird, time. especially if you're like on the road trying to find someone in the backwoods. Like, really? Yeah. Like, I can't keep a grudge going for more than 24 hours. Like, because right. I need Ryan for things. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, like right now, I'm kind of irritated at him. So, like, if I texted him right now and was like, "Could you please pour me a glass of wine?" Like, it'd be over, and I wouldn't keep that. Like, the thing I'm irritated with him about would be done because I really need that glass of wine. So, uh, like, times that by like 50 of us like tramping through the wilderness and trying to like keep bears and savages from killing us. Like, she needs Jamie for things. They're gonna have to communicate. Like, whatever's going on, I'm sure they would have to discuss it and like get over it because she's going to be like, you know. Keep me warm tonight, please. <laughs> I'm not talking to you, but you better put your warm back on me. <laughs> I'm going to put my feet on you. And what is the likelihood that the two you of them. You know penises are really warm. They are from the inside out. So like at what point is it believable that for a month 
they're going through the wilderness, sleeping in camps together no. and not doing it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's like zero belief. Like I would give it mm -hmm. two days or three maybe. days tops. Maybe. Tops. Especially because they need each other for warmth. Yeah. And because like all of these are not all of these people. Ian is with them. How fucking awkward. Ian's the only one talking. Like, yeah. And like, if he knew why Jamie was mad the whole time, like, he would have taken Claire aside at some point before 30 days had gone by and been like, hey, there's been a misunderstanding. I wouldn't have been like, like with that kind of close quarters. I wouldn't have been able to last an afternoon with someone else, like fighting with the person I'm with. I went on a trip once and the two people I was with were fighting. And I was like, well, I'm going to go to the cafe. This better be over by the time I get back. <laughs> right. It's so uncomfortable not. Being as uncomfortable sitting around being uncomfortable because you want the other person to be uncomfortable so they know that you're uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> but I am gonna agree with Amy that I love their actual their actual love for each other is the reason they're they can't speak to one another. Like there's it's not like this petty grudge. It's like these real it's real feelings. And I love <laughs> I love like Jamie's reaction to why he's upset and I love their her explanation as well mm. so i'm okay with it i just wish it wasn't a month long i loved Whatever. the the makeup sex she described it really well when like jamie turned to claire with like quiet ferocity i was like that's so beautiful <laughs> how have you made love to with quiet ferocity and they're Wait, doing it in public and don't even care they're in like the long house, long with house? Everybody. yeah mm -hmm. yeah i think that that's hot I kind of miss communal sleeping because I think that would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> no that one share room. Giving hand jobs that. and uh, sleeping bags. I, I do miss <laughs> the back of the church bus. I gotta be honest. <laughs> <laughs> oh, heavens! To uh, I'm, I'm sitting here looking on my so phone so you all can see. Like, la, 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 la. I just realized <laughs> that there's a chapter called Captivity One. And it's about Roger with the Mohawk. And then the next chapter is called Captivity. Two. And then the next chapter is called Captivity 2. And it's about Brianna at River Run. And those two uh, things <laughs> should not. Totally the same. Totally. <laughs> the the overhanded, like heavy, sorry, heavy handed way that she's comparing their two situations. Or yeah. There's no comparison whatsoever. Like I just read. <laughs> This line for Vienna, I don't want a grand place. I don't want this Jesus. place. Outrage in turn was giving way to panic. That she's like complaining. Is and Diana trying to say having that, like, to run a gauntlet? She's saying like pregnancy is a captivity. That an too. equal captivity to being starved and beaten by the Mohawk. Brianna's captivity is one of femaleness. Why can't we just get rid of all chapter titles in every single book? I think they're all such the poor author is trying to be so clever and I just don't give a shit. Just give me numbers. <laughs> By poor author, you mean Diana. You know she lives Well, any for that. of them. I just feel like it, I usually you know, when you're reading the chapter title you're like, okay, well, I guess I'll figure that out. But then by the time you're done with the chapter, you've usually forgotten what the chapter title was anyway. And it's not like I'm going back to yeah. read what the chapter title was to be like, oh, you're so clever. <laughs> I have not read a chapter title in my entire life. Right. It's just a, it's a waste. <laughs> it's so What's wrong, Beth? I just, I just find it so funny that <laughs> Authors are trying really hard to like succinctly make this cute little metaphor for their whole chapter, and Amy is like, "Next, <laughs> don't even bother. Don't even. You're not even. You're not. You're not uh, giving me anything. So save yourself the hassle. Oh my! And when you're reading a book on a plane, and the chapter title is really weird. Like this one is Confessions of the Flesh. <laughs> the, person, like, the person next to you has no idea what you're reading, but they can see the chapter <laughs> title. Yeah. And you're like, oh God. <laughs> That's where it's normal. Um, I'm gonna jump in because this is funny. Uh, or that this discussion was funny. But Leslie, LSE Leslie, 
Alexa uh, retweet or tweeted us the picture of the actor playing Ulysses, and he played a bad guy in a Hallmark Christmas movie. So, oh, we here prepare. we can prepare for that. Well, I'll just say he played it. She also mentioned that it was with Rupert Penry Jones, who's one of my faves. Rupert Penry who's Jones. That? Oh, like he's, Captain, with the, he's in the gaping mob um, persuasion. Yes, he's in yes. the persuasion with, oh. um, uh, pfft, what's her name? Sally Fields. Not Sally Fields. Sally, <laughs> what's her name? Hawkins. Sally Hawkins. Yeah, oh. gaping mob. And mom. that like gaping mob is the worst. But he's such a good Wentworth. Mm. Wow. Hi, honey Lips sent us a tweet about makeup sex with that little diver from the UK <laughs> ripping his clothes off. <laughs> and Honey Lips. I don't know who you are, but you're the most delightfully horny woman on the internet. And you, know, you just keep, you make me so happy. Well, she said us something? Yeah, well, she put it I under the hashtag. I missed it. Okay, hold on. Let me find it. She's here for the makeup She sex. is always <laughs> here for it. If it's the, the booty, she's here for it. And I love it. Her consistency. You be you, honey lips. It does kind of crack me up that she has Lucy from the Peanuts. <laughs> so I always imagine Lucy is wildly horny, and um, Lucy was right. Lucy though, right? is horny. She was wanting it from who was it? Schroeder. Schroeder. That was it. She, I played she's Lucy such a net. She negs you, man. Mm -hmm. And she's bossy. No, no, no. I mean she jingle bells. You feelings. know, ho ho and mistletoe and presents for pretty girl. <laughs> you have it memorized. I have wow. memorized too. Did you play Lucy in a play in the fifth grade as well? I didn't, but I just relate to her so much. Like my <laughs> picture I tweeted today was Lucy from the, what do you call it? The Great Pumpkin with that mask Aww. that she wears. It's just like, fuck all y'all. Well, should we talk about the makeup sex of Roger and Brianna? And wait, talk about can the we, end of this thing? Wait, we have to talk about her going to see Bonnet first. Oh God, the worst storyline of all. Yeah. Yes. I've, so I've, I left off right in that scene. Is that right? Does he escape? Yeah. Is yes. it on fire and he escapes? Okay. Mm -hmm. And he I tries say, to go with her, him. Yeah, I'm gonna say that very, Diana doesn't normally write action to the point where I don't understand what's going on. I have to go back and reread to see where yes. things are and who's talking and what happened. I had no idea what was going on in that section, none. Zero. Yeah. And, and it, it doesn't, it, it just, it's like, she, it, like, why does he come back? He leaves her there. And then all of a sudden this, he's. He has like a sense that that's his child or whatever. No way. That's he, not what like, he Remember, that. after, remember because after she's after trying the tree? To, she wants to have it both ways with him. Yes. She's trying to redeem him. She's given him the three billboards and Ebbing's wherever the hell. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the horrible racist guy gets redeemed in the end. Um, she wants to kind of redeem him. He's not such a bad rapist. You know, that he argues with Brianna about fire engineering. And, and Is that then really why he comes back? I, I, like, yes. I'm reading it thinking that it has something to do with he was trying to get out and that way it was blocked and he had to come back or something. No. Because it made no – he was gone for a long time. Yeah. No, I he, think he tries – he makes – he's trying to save he's her. He's trying to save her. Because he notices that she doesn't come out because once he gets Lord John and her outside and they're at that tree, he's like, "You is it really mine? Come with me, lassie, or whatever dumb shit he says. And I was like, you're out of your mind. You're literally trying to say that this is a character who's, he's good. He's, you know, he saved her and now he's going to take care of the baby. No! I was so upset. Uh, well, I I'm floored. Like I'm yeah. floored thinking that that's what's really going on. I figured it was, it was just terrible. like an action sequence that didn't make sense to me. Well, it was that too, but yeah, that, but that he's was trying to end. Just, and they're wrapping up the whole Murchison stuff that you don't give a shit about. And oh, yeah, I have to like remind myself who Murchison is, and then this, and then I'm like, I do not care yeah. about that. At yeah, all. I was like, wait, why do I know this guy? That's what tipped me off that the whole thing was like a it was a farce, like he's gonna somehow escape the whole thing is you know like why in the hell would lord john gray ever take this very pregnant woman down into the cell of some prison or whatever it was under a warehouse and let her go in by herself like it was so unbelievable 
You wouldn't and, do that. And at the same time, you're worried that something like what happened to Claire and Jamie at Wentworth is going to happen too. Like I had that in the back of my mind, like something is like, especially when she's like, oh, you're not chained. What? And I was like, wait a minute, where's Lord John? Like why is yes. he not saying it? The whole thing, I was like, this is, this is, it felt like a, like, like just a comedy that I yes. wasn't understanding. And I was just like, this is banana sandwich. So the action mm -hmm. in that sequence is dumb. And like the whole thing that's happening is yeah. the yeah. fact that she was there when Bonnet escapes is uh, a level of coincidence and bad writing that I'm not willing to like suspend my disbelief for. That all was bananas. And the fact that she thinks well, that she's not going to die. Like she thinks that that ceiling is not going to collapse in colonial North Carolina. Like, yeah, and she's giving him like a little win. bitty fire. And that whole thing is coming down. And he's got like barrels of turpentine. Yeah. She's like, she's oh, like, it's brick. Oh, it's you mean it might catch on fire because you didn't close the cellar yes, door. Cellar. Like, what? Yes. Yeah. It's going to blow up, not yeah. out. Uh, Brianna, you are not a physics or a fire or a chemistry or any sort of major. You didn't go to college. Maybe you did. I can't remember. Get Some out. Knowledge. You idiot. Get out. <laughs> I mean, it would be different if you were like, I don't know, in a bomb shelter or something, something with like concrete. And I mean, there's literally no reason for her not to think that that's not going to collapse on top of her. And then he's like, no, down here, it's all wood. And she's like, what? I can't believe something built in the colonial era is going to be mo mostly wood. I better run. It's And so I didn't dumb. know about it. I know everything. Oh, really? it's super dumb. Yeah. Um, I'm but surprised I really, she didn't like grab her by the face and kiss her as he gave her the diamond. That seems like something that she would write. Yes, does right. he not? It seems like he probably did. No, he, he just stands her. her. Right. And it was no, scintillating. That's, that's, oh. George, that's John Gray kisses her. Oh. Well, Morgan on Twitter says, they have to say bonnet for the next book. we got to drag out the rape theme. <laughs> yep. Oh, my. I don't remember him in the fifth book, so I don't know if that's going to happen. Or she not. shoots him in the head. Remember to save his life because he's going to get drowned at the. He does get caught eventually. But yeah, so it's really she's right. Morgan's right. So they can kind of continue out this exactly. Rihanna victimhood, but it seems like a weird type of victimhood. Is it the same thing that Claire? It's the same thing that Claire does with Frank. It's the exact same thing when she refuses to let Jamie. Kill, kill Randall because yeah. of the potential future for Frank. And she yeah. is constantly going back to that theme of you can't hurt him. You can't hurt, you know, like there's, yeah. there's more going on or constantly just hurting Jamie with the reality of Frank or the reality mm -hmm. of Randall and, um, and, and not caring about the fact that, you know, let that like excise that man from your life to, for the sake of the one that you really love. And, and Brie does the same thing with Bonnet. Why can't she just excise that from, I'm not saying that she has to give it over her trauma, but why in the world would you try to save? Yeah, you shouldn't save them. It's like a weird Nightingale victim thing. I don't yeah, know. It's, it's bananas. It's very and what weird. is Diana trying to say with his character? Like, yeah, you can, be a, a, you can be a rapist, but you can also have a lot of good in you or something redeemable in you or, he had, you know, yeah. I, I don't like what she's trying to say. And all of the emotional labor to, for your, for the rapist redemption has, has to come at the expense of the victim. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. And like, there's going to be something about, you know, him giving her the diamond and, you know, allow, you know, isn't the diamond is eventually what allows them to go back with Jim maybe later or something like that. So like. Well, now they have like a pocket full of gems at this point. Yes. Like, but I a mean, there's just this, gems. she does, she gives him too many opportunities. There's an opportunity for him to claim the child, which is you, you automatically assume that that's going to come up. Something's going to happen. He's going to claim this kid, whether it could just be to be able to get something out of Jamie Fraser later on or something like that. He's going to try to claim that child as his own. It's going to cause problems. He gives her the diamond, which is meant to redeem him. He goes back and saves it. This is all a lot of effort to make this guy out to be not as bad as he is is on top of the fact that she's already made him slightly charming, like his personality right. and the way that he yeah. talks. And then on top of that, made the rape scene titillating and like a real love scene. There's just way too much going on for her to, for, and maybe she, 
when she thinks about complicated villains, she thinks anti-hero or something, but like, I don't, I just think there's no real point in this. Yeah. I mean, you can have, you know, rape fantasies, you can read books about rape fantasies, but those are things that are what they are. Like, that's not, that's not what this book is. This isn't some fan fiction on lit erotica that someone wrote about like a forced consent kind of sex right. thing. Right. You know, and it's it's a little bit insulting. I not a little bit. I feel like it's a lot insulting to any woman who has been assaulted in her life. You know yeah. that it's, it's almost like she's trying to say, like, were you really that assaulted, Brianna? Was it really that bad? And that's just you know, it bugs well, me. She literally does have Jamie say that to her, essentially. Yeah, yeah, he does say that to our section. It just makes you wonder why she uses sexual violence as like story points or main turning points for all of the characters. Aww. Why? Like, is it just sure that was that's a thing, but also all of the characters? Is it lazy writing? I, you know, there's much more interesting ways to form a character than just sexual violence. Yeah. Mm. And if she wanted to find a reason for Roger staying with her or Bree staying in the in the past, et cetera, um, and giving that drama, there's there's a lot she could have done that 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 I feel like could could have created that problem as well. Um, without not maybe nothing as quick as a rape. Yeah. But um, plenty of ways to to get that done. But I mean there's Oh, Dee just said that keeping Bonnet around is to drag out the vengeance plot for Jamie um, for the next two books. Wait, Stephen Bonnet's around for two more books? Oh, right, because he kidnaps her in the next book. Oh, yeah. <sighs> and they bond some more. And they then she cute, kills cute little him. Moments. She kills him when she runs into um, Willie <laughs> before are. Willie goes off to the dismal swamp in the following book. J.F.C. Hey. Oh goodness! <laughs> I think you mean J H R C. Guys, it's a it's a lot. That's a lot. He's, I mean, uh, love is in the air. I can't see your name. The lady Gordon just said he's an oblivious rapist. I roll. He, yeah. <laughs> guys, it's it's just a lot. That's a lot. There's a lot that Diana is putting into this into that character. That's just completely unnecessary. So let's just hope that the show has the smarts to handle it correctly. Yeah. I.e. not have to be a rapist. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Um, let's talk really quick about Claire, the birth. I want to talk about the, the skull that she found. This is going to be something that we've already seen in the previews for the show. She finds this skull with silver fillings, and we find out in this section that the skull with silver fillings is someone who went back and tried to warn the Iroquois about um, what was going to happen to them. And they saw him as someone with a demon. With a I spirit. find that so heartbreaking and so, so interesting. I, I love that the best. Yeah. Another character that I could read an entire yes. totally. story about. And that's what's compelling. It's like, it's Jamie and Claire trying to save the Scottish people from... Culloden, it's this guy try using time travel to save the Iroquois. This is what, that's the interesting stuff. Yeah. Not this yeah. other weird shit. Yeah. There needs to be an anthology of like all the different time travelers going back and trying to save the um, change time. Yeah. Cause yeah, like Gaelis did it and. Yeah. That would be a lot of fun to read like how they, and even how they fit together and how they intersect or how they almost intersect and all that stuff mm -hmm. would be cool. Mm -hmm. Um, I did wish that there had been, I mean, I know that she finds the skull at one point and then she finds the opal and then she has that, that weird dream that, that brings the opal to her or whatever. And then there's just this, I wish that the thread of that particular guy was a, a little bit more evident throughout the novel. Um, right. I don't really know how that would be or how it would work out. But I wish that like, maybe just the reveal of him. I wish it wasn't just some story that this old lady is telling her. Like, I, I guess it's like 
remnants of having read so many fantasy novels that when they bring up something like a ghost who brings you mm -hmm. like magic jewels or whatever, that that's not, it's not for um, several, you know, hundred pages later for somebody to just tell you the story of how that happened and you go, and then you figure out that he's a time traveler too and that's it. Like literally Claire listens to this long story about this dude and then she's like, Oh, his ticky back, his ticket back, his ticket back. Like, and mm -hmm. we're supposed to be like, ka -ching, we get it. He was a time traveler too. There's the guy with the silver fillings. And it's a sad story, but at the same time, like all of the footprints that were gonna that led you there are missing. And it's just a, literally someone telling you what happened instead of it showing you the progression of her figuring that out or how it impacts her. Um, in her plot or whatever, it just doesn't impact her really at all, and that kind of sucks. I wish that it was. That would have been a great story. Forget all this Murchison and smuggling and stuff. Have you know? Why does he have to be dead? Have her run in. You know, have them run into this guy. Yeah, or while have he's the actively fact that, trying, or, or have, have them appear to her again. It. Yeah, or the stuff that she finds have it have actual menace. Like mm -hmm. the fact that she has that opal, maybe they are really like trying to sell it or trying to use it or like they're, and it causes like real menace with the indigenous people in different ways. And there's other people who are okay with it. And you know what I mean? Like, let it be part of something that, that moves the story forward and, um, in, in, in a more compelling way, especially if she's going to, if it's going to be magical. Like I want, I always end up wanting the magical, supernatural, whatever you want to call it, stuff in these novels to be way more fleshed out than they are. She just like throws in these tidbits to be like, oh, a smallpox scar. Oh, the ticky back. Like it's always like these little bits and it's never like kind of a fully fleshed out idea of what these people were and, and how they intersect right. with where she is. And I always wish there was more. Yeah. Or tell just, them the B story to the whole thing that's congruently running and then somehow weave it together into the main yes. story. Yes. That, that's, yeah, that's exactly what I mean. Absolutely. Yeah. Just I just wanted to find out. out. Oh, sorry. Go I just wanted it. to find out how Claire's boots got back to Fraser Ridge. Like if because <laughs> oh, yeah. remember when she was lost overnight and like Otter Tooth appeared to her and then her boots, her shoes end up. I just wanted that explained. And then you find out his story, which I hadn't remembered at all. And it's like he doesn't appear to Claire again. Like there's no connection to Claire. Like, okay, she found out who he was, but like all that other buildup and mystery and mysticism, like fizzled out and went nowhere. But then there, there is a little bit of that mysticism or spooky stuff to hit to when the old lady is telling the story. Because remember, they kill him, they cut off his head, like the, the skull is still talking to him. Like she kind of wants to play around with this magical world, but like it, things are never really explained. Yeah. She doesn't want to be magic everywhere. To yeah. Yeah. She's I'm fine with the boots. Yeah, I'm fine with things not always playing out immediately or within the same book, like building out a very long storyline. That's fine, but she doesn't do that. Like, there's not a, she can't. Be, I don't know if she just can't. Yeah, commit or something. I think it's you a world building to, issue. You get no. have you you guys if you haven't read the next book or maybe it's the book after that, you do get to meet one of the time travelers that came over with that dude. Oh, that's cool. In real time. But yeah, like two books from now. Yeah, I mean, but that's the thing. Like, I don't feel like she's fully committed to that world. I don't think that she's fully, um, you know, thought through the world building of, of who connects where and what they do. I think she just like randomly throws in, oh, Master Raymond could end up being like Claire's ancestor at some point or whatever. And you're just kind of like, you know, he looks like a frog or whatever, but like maybe he's one of Claire's like great, 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 great uncles or something. It's just like kind of a, it's, it's always so benign. None of it actually affects plot in real ways. It always affects secondary plot. And it always is just like something for Claire to figure out that might affect whether or not they travel back in the future at some point. But like, it's never imminent and it never fits together in a puzzling way that feels satisfying when you get to the answer. And that's kind of really a frustrating, even with Galus, who is, I would, I would argue probably the most prominent time traveler of the series other than Claire herself. In other words, right. like the one that we think about the most, like when she went back and what she was trying to do and how she died. And Claire sees her skull in the sixties. Right. And it ends up being a skull that she, somebody she mm -hmm. killed in the, in the past. So 
there's she's the most prominent in terms of like her storyline has through lines throughout several of the novels and even that is not fully um outlined it's it doesn't have the same impact as it would if it felt like she had really gone through um world building how the time travelers work and what's going on even with Galus and she's the one who has the grimoire and everything like it's still just not enough i mean you read for instance, my favorite books, the Lumetier Chronicles, they're full of magic and like there's a prophecy that's going through the whole thing. And at the same time, the whole book, the books are very much grounded in reality. And then when things come to light, things that the Oracle has said about the princess that's later on this, and it's just like, even three books later, you're like, oh my God. I mean, it's just like this, these amazing reveals versus Versus the way Diana writes, where it tends to be just like vignettes of things that are kind of cool. I mean, this story about this particular time traveler is a vignette in this story that's kind of cool, but it doesn't have a through line that impacts right. the, ma the main story in any real way. Yeah. It feels like four books in, Diana one had a great idea about a romance between the characters of Jamie and Claire and time travel and the magic and the mysticism is a side point that she wrote in because she didn't want to see be seen as a romance writer and so that greatly affects how the story works yeah mm -hmm. for her but she didn't um, want to be a fantasy author either yeah she doesn't want to put her stake in whatever genre it is for whatever reason and the story at times suffers still yeah. an interesting story obviously we're sitting here talking about it but yeah. There are things she could do better. Lady Gordon just said on Twitter, um, is he the one who walks in her shoes? Because that was clear as shit. And I can't decide <laughs> if she means it's really obvious or you can't see through shit. So it's not obvious at all. So you could tell us what you mean. But like, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, yes, he's the same ghost that walks in her shoes. But again, mm -hmm. how is he corporal or corporeal? How is he corporeal? And like, how is that how you say that word anyway oh, like how is corporeal yeah corporeal and so like i i figured like i feel like i've heard it's corp corporeal anyway it doesn't matter um it means of the body i took four <laughs> years of latin um so anyway i just i don't know how he does that i don't know how his head was talking to these indians as they're carrying it and he's been you know decapitated but um, I don't know what's going on. I really don't know how the shoes ended up there. I don't know how a ghost who's a time traveler does that. Other than at the time when I was reading it, I was I was also thinking that he's got whatever gene Jamie has that allows him to walk through the worlds after his death. You know oh. what I mean? Like Jamie's got this thing where he shows up in book one that she planned out, which she didn't plan out because she's told right. us a million times she doesn't plan anything. She just writes. So it shows, right? I so I think he might have get, had that thing. I don't get why he would help her though. Like, why would he help this white girl when he's traveled back in time to warn all the the Iroquois or Mohawk about the white people? Like, he wants them to rise up and kill the white people, but now he's going to save this English woman. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't get why he would help her. Who knows, girl? knowing she's another time traveler but again like there's maybe there's that kinship but again like <laughs> i know it's that's what i'm saying none of it is really, she wants to kill all the really. White folk. like we're not dumb like what i read a lot like i get when things go together i mean when, especially if i read it closely i wasn't really reading this closely but like <laughs> we get it and i still kind of don't get it so it sucks when it's like that um birthing time yay I, I love a good pregnancy and I love a good birth story and I'll listen to them all day. Like, love it. You can talk to me about your births all the time. I will listen to every detail and suck it in. Um, <laughs> and I loved Brianna's birth story. It felt so yeah. real to me. I was totally into it. I love that Jamie was in there. I love that she was refusing to let him leave. It was super awesome. Yeah. I and love that it was like you have Jamie and Brianna having the emotion of the birth and then you have Claire who is the business and knows what all the what could happen you know is just doing the work of getting the baby there i love like those kind of two running yeah stories at the same time i think she's kind of detached too but like yeah. i also like at some point she 
she meant she's very specific and says that she goes under her shift when it looks like Brianna is about to start pushing and touches this flesh that she hasn't touched since Brianna was a baby. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to go, why were you not checking to see if she was dilated? <laughs> no. First time. <laughs> like, right. at, why did she not do any prep work at all to make sure she could push? Like, she's <laughs> a surgeon, a modern surgeon. And she's not like, let me check your cervix. <laughs> well, she could have also had that sensation or, or emotion or thought while she's checking to see if she was dilated. Yes. Right. So, she's like, I just oiled my fingers and then felt a thing. And I was like, her hoo-ha doesn't look like it's the size of a baseball because it totally should. It should look like a big black hole up in there. What's going on? It kills me. <laughs> it kills me sometimes with the details that just make no sense. It makes no sense for Claire not to have checked her cervix at some point. Yeah. I mean, I had a friend once who was having a baby, and we had this other friend that's a labor and delivery nurse, like really good friend. She was like, you need to come over and check me because I don't know if I need to go to the hospital or not. So we're all sitting there, and she's like in bed <laughs> having her good friend check her cervix. <laughs> I mean, it's like a thing women do. In the world. <laughs> I have a C-section, so this is all very bizarre. <laughs> I had student student doctors in, in my room, and there's like 80 people when I gave birth the first time. I was like, hey, come on. <laughs> hey, everyone. What's up? That's like, you're going to learn today. <laughs> right. <laughs> you're going to learn what not to do, because I had a terrible first birth. But anyway. Oh, no. Uh, well, I loved that part of the story, though. And it's also kind of like after, it's so cute how Jamie always wants to hold the baby. Like, it's very much a family affair. Like, everyone's very into this baby with no name. <laughs> Gizmo. <laughs> Gizmo. And yeah, Jamie kind of gets... Osbert? Osbert, yeah. <laughs> like, what is Osbert? Who knows? At first, I thought it was, like, Offbert, like, from... The Handmaid's Tale, like she was had to read that or something. I was like, that wasn't written till the 80s. No. And then I reread it. I was like, oh, Osbert. I don't know what she's Osbert. talking about. I have no idea where she got that from, but it was, it was, thing? yeah, it was sweet that like this is kind of the first baby Jamie has gotten to really be a part of the babyhood of, you know, the newbornness. Yeah. He's like, like so super excited about it Jamie. too. Yeah. He he's, is, he's pumped. So yeah. He's like, well, I he was there when what's his name was born? We Ian, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah he that's what like, I mean. He's like, I may not know who this kid's dad is, but I definitely know who his grandson like, is. Yeah, he's like so excited sweet. about it. Called her Granny. <laughs> oh. Granddad Jamie is my kink. It's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> Um, speaking of kink, hold on, I gotta open my phone up. But um, Lady Gorgon, she's been killing me tonight. She just tweeted and said, regarding the wacky sexual mores, I've always bet DG is writing BDSM stories for submissives on the side on some random website for a dollar ninety nine a story. Hundred <laughs> percent. Yes, she is. Hundred percent doing that. She wrote just for fun. She's like, this Tyrannosaurus made me gay. That's like her. <laughs> God, that's so funny. Uh, what if she does? Oh, you got a okay. retweet. Everybody needs a side hustle. <laughs> she definitely, she does that for fun. She doesn't even collect the money. That's right. She's <laughs> no, just she just loves researching that. weird shit and just writing about it. Yeah. And the thing is, I could do with the whole book of Jamie, like, in a birthing room. I want to hear all the stories that he said. I want to see his face at every turn. Mm -hmm. Like when she just pulls her boob out and starts, you know, nursing or whatever, is he like, how is he? Is he not like, uh, that's enough. Or is he like, hmm. I mean, yeah. I want to, I want to know exactly what Jamie's face is doing. I want to know what's going through his head. I want to know it all. I could take fan fiction of that birthing, Jamie in the birthing room, granddaddy Jamie all day. Yeah. <laughs> I could do a Some whole book. That's fantastic. <laughs> whole book of the last like three four five chapters like birth life on the ridge roger brianna gathering i just like want all the fluff of the story and less of the traveling to mohawk land. does anybody want to tell nikki about book five 
Oh God, is it all sad? <laughs> oh yeah, you told me a terrible gathering story. It's nothing it's but the gathering. Two hundred pages it never ends. You're gonna get all the gathering, like. But I want good. I want the Mackenzies are here gathering. I don't want like this is how we grind corn gathering. <laughs> it's a lot of like washing diapers in the river, of but also a lot of like the yeah. They're like the Mackenzies, you know, and the Camerons, and all that stuff too. So. Yeah, I love that part. That I'm down for. Yeah, I cried a little when I read when Ian comes out. We haven't talked about Ian sacrificing oh, himself for man. Roger. And when he comes in, I I really am looking forward to seeing that on the show. Like, yes. I don't know. Like, there, I feel like that's going to – it had to be such a shock for all of them. And I just want to see – I want to see it be so shocking when he comes in and looks like that. Mm -hmm. And – um. I cried a little when Jamie gave him like a little bit of tartan and put it on his shoulder and just said, remembering Gaelic. And I was like, oh, God. So good. We, Ian. I mean, as and dorky. John Bell. Yeah. I was just about to go off on John Bell. You can go he off. Looks so, I mean, he looks first. so young anyways. Like, he's just so yes. young. Like, just, he's going to like. He's going to look like a little toddler, like dressed up as an Indian on Halloween. And it's going to be so sad. I mean, I love that he looks horrific in our little in the water weeds graphic. <laughs> I love him in all these dumb videos that the Outlander social media does because he is the only interesting person, you know, my, besides a few of them. Like, I just I feel like, like Lauren Lyle. Yeah, I love Lauren, too. But I feel like he's just going to be I hope he's going to take to like a duck to water. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. And this every time fun. she mentions that, like, Ian is homely, I'm like, okay. Okay. We get that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, a, like, a couple months ago, I think the first in the Wonder Reads, I said I always pictured Adam Driver as <laughs> young Ian. And it was for this scene because I just see him coming in, like, shirtless and in buckskin, like, with the tattoos. And it does a lot. Homely. It does a lot for me. He's homely, but. Homely. <laughs> yeah. I like just that's how I, that's how I imagine it. I'm hoping there's some like shaved head action, and yeah. the tattoos are interesting looking. <laughs> yeah, I want him to still be like crusty, where it looks yeah. like he's like crying blood. <laughs> I want it to be really graphic, and I just want Jamie to be broken. Oh yeah, I, I think Sam that. will do really well. I hope so. I'm excited about that. Yeah. I'm excited about my heart being ripped out, but I yeah, really want to much. care about Ian up to that yeah. point. If he's like just bumbling around being silly and like, not really like, like you want to see him really heartbroken for what happens to when they figure out what they did to Roger. I want to see like real. And him and Emily throughout the season. Yes. Yeah. And I want to see him be really capable once they get to the, get to the Mohawks. Like he's right. the one who knows mm -hmm. the language and he's the one who's, with Emily all the time and like knows what's going on and he's maneuvering and, and basically like Jamie says he, he would make a great spy. Like I want to see Ian being very capable in that like context so that when this happens, it's like, Oh, that is heartbreaking. <laughs> Just going to mm -hmm. go die now. So. And the letter they, about he sends them. Oh, it's going to be a dad. Okay. Anyway. I good. also like that part because it's almost like he's he is sacrificing himself, but it's almost like he's making a life of himself outside of Jamie because Jamie is so everything, you know, it's allowing yeah. him to kind of go off and be his own man. And like you said, we need to see him being capable because he is capable. Yeah. It's like I'm not worried about him in that scene. It's more of just kind of like, whoa, I'm just, I was yeah. we were reading it and just being like, whoa. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. impressed, I guess, is the right word that I was, yeah. I was very impressed with him by making that choice. And also, he's like kind of in love. So it's not totally shocking that he's doing it, but yeah. yeah. You're just well, sad I, that they're not going to be close and there's not going to be, you know, that daily interaction. Like, that yeah. He's yeah he's essentially moved away. Like he's yeah, gone. Exactly. And, they and how is Jamie going to tell Jenny to? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. He's going to write that letter to Jenny. Yeah. It's not like, and that's the thing. Ian can't communicate with them anymore. Like it's not like he just like decided to go to Philadelphia or whatever. Like he can't communicate with them anymore. He can't write letters. 
He did um, send in that letter that they got at the gathering, though. That's true. I think yeah. it'll, I'm sure it all comes back around that Ian, they cross paths and maybe they all live together again. Who knows? I'm sure that in a book that I haven't read. <laughs> yes, um, in, a, in a future book. Well, there, those of us who've read. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a we young know. man. There's a reason he's been with the Mohawk all this yeah, time. Of and he course comes through. Is. He's going to come through. Come through, yeah. young Ian. He's going to come through and save them from whatever issues. Just like Lord John magically is coming through being the governor of Virginia or whatever <laughs> it is. And you're like, ah, okay. Of course. That's super realistic. It happened. So we're glad he's there at River Run to be the one to hang out with Brianna in her last month's <laughs> banana sandwich. Anyway, so anything else we want to talk about at the end of this book before we say sayonara to Drums of Autumn? Oh, it's been fun. I'm excited for the season just to just That's because it's fresh in my thing. mind. We had um, a guest post last week where um, uh, a guest writer of ours, I can't remember her name. I'm sorry. Elise. Um, Elise um, did, has said she wasn't reading it at all because she wanted to watch the season um, with all the surprises. And that is a fun thing to do. I may not yes. read Fiery Cross. Not just because I hate it, <laughs> so bad. but just to see if season five is better for me or something. I don't know. Who knows? Yeah. I'm interested to see what she thinks once it uh, starts airing. Yeah. And of course what we think, which will, is that next week? Oh my God. It's next week. Mm -hmm. Next oh, Monday. Yeah. Uh, we'll be back yeah. here. Sunday. Oh God. Oh, we that have a really gross person on. <laughs> what happened? Oh, do we have like a weirdo? Are there trolls in the YouTube chat? Yeah, sorry. Oh. I want to see it. What's he saying? Read it out loud. Is it gross? Someone said sit on a bong, girls, or suck a bong. Bong? What's the name? Is it? I prefer to suck the same on one than sit on one, but maybe I'm it's like a vagina remove. steamer and it works the <laughs> other way too. I'm sorry for anybody who had to. <laughs> I'm going to put this user in a timeout. <laughs> That'll <apologize>. teach him. <laughs> apologize to the rest of you that had to look at that. Anyway, that's in the water weeds, guys. We do have hangout under next week, I guess. I don't know. We haven't even planned hangout. We haven't. Under. We have not. We should talk about that after um, I go to Trader Joe's. Yeah, you guys tell us what you want to do this year. See if we can, I don't know, maybe we'll do it differently. We've done it yeah. differently every year. If, if anybody remembers, it used to be called Talking Outlander. Oh, yeah. Originally. Because it was talking normal. The first, mm -hmm, the first eight episodes were Talking Outlander. And then came up with Hang Outlander. And then it changed. It was like Sunday afternoons. Anybody remember doing it on Sunday afternoons? That was mm -hmm. a good time. Mm -hmm. Like, it really cut into my naps. And I <laughs> like that. So, anyway. Um, Hang Outlanders next week. We hope to see you then. And uh, in the meantime... Let us know what you think of uh, In the Water Weeds and Drums of Autumn. We will see you guys very soon. Bye, everybody.